Hello everyone, we're going to start now. <laughs> Hi, welcome to the School of Law International Women's Day event. Uh, we are from Peel Court Chambers and today we're here to talk to you about using the law to protect women's rights and where the law can go further. Uh, 2022 marks 100 years since the first women were called to the bar with Ivy Williams in May 1922 and Helena Normanton shortly after in November 1922. Women at that time were really starting to break into a wider range of employment and this was very much facilitated by the Sex Disqualification Removal Act of 1919. That act provided that a person could not be disqualified against uh, by sex or marriage from exercising any public function, holding any civil or judicial office, entering any civil profession, or being admitted to any incorporated society. We are going to be focusing on existing legal protections for women today. And in particular, how the Equality Act 2010 protects against unlawful discrimination. Of course, protections for women exist in many different formats, including many of those protections which are also available to men, such as breach of contract, tortious claims, family law rights, and others. Introducing everyone we've got with us today, we've got, uh, moving along the line, we've got Sarah McEwen, who is a specialist in housing and public law, and she sits as a DDJ in the first tier tribunal and now also as a reporter. We also have um, Anna Dan Reuter, moving down the line, who specialises in um, employment, commercial and public law, and some of you may know her as a public law tutor here at St Mary's. She regularly represents women in discrimination claims, which is one of the focuses of this discussion. And then at the end, we have Nicholas Clark. Um, he specializes in the full range of employment claims and also sits part of the time as an employment judge. Via video screen looming over us all, we have Helena Sibley in the corner there. Um, she focuses on public law, local government practice, especially claims about adult and child social care, health care, and section 114, uh, sorry, section 117 aftercare. And finally, I'm Natalie York. I specialize in family law, particularly child protection, and I'm here to chair the event and I'm looking very much forward to learning myself. Now, we want this very much to be a group discussion and participation is very much encouraged, even from the people at the front. <laughs> and if you have a question uh, or you have something you want to add, do please put your hand up either physically or digitally in the, uh, in the chat box. We'd love to hear from you. Now, we're going to start with Anna, who's going to give us an overview of the law. Thank you so much, Natalie, and hello to everyone um, online and in person. A particular welcome to uh, people from my public law class. Uh, this is noted um, <laughs> and, uh, and, and very much encouraged. Um, so yes, uh, welcome everyone. I'm going to give a bit of an overview about the history of the Equality Act. Um, Natalie's already started us off with the Sex Disqualification Removal Act 1919. This allowed women to enter the professions and for the first time women could become barristers. Now you'll see today we have a, a majority of women barristers on our panel, and we also have Nick, <laughs> token male, um, and so um, we're very much looking forward to running through um, women's rights protections with you um, today. Um, as Natalie mentioned, these can appear in many different formats, and obviously women have uh, are able to exercise their contractual rights, their tortious rights, just as well as men, but there are particular uh, specific laws targeting gender discrimination, um, and we will be focusing on the Equality Act 2010, um, but I want to just take you back to um, the Sex Discrimination Act 1975, which essentially accounted for the fact that the 1919 Act didn't cover in employment uh, discrimination. So while the 1919 Act I mentioned covered access to the professions, there was nothing regulating discrimination taking part once you were employed. So the Sex Discrimination Act um, 1975 um, accounted for this and section one said, a person discriminates against a woman in any circumstances on the ground of her sex uh, if he treats her less favorably than he treats or would treat a man. So that was the 1975 Act, um, and we had parallel acts for disability discrimination and race discrimination, race discrimination in 76, disability discrimination in 95, 
Um, and essentially what the Equality Act 2010 did was it brought them all together and it strengthened them. And the Minister for Equalities, um, Harriet Harman, said that um, it was time to declutter the law. And she said, our discrimination laws have helped us make progress on equality, but because they have developed over more than 40 years, they've become extremely complex. Um, there are around 100 statutory instruments, multiple acts, um, 2,500 pages of guidance. And so what the Equality Act 2010 would do would be to uh, consolidate all of these laws and strengthen them as well. Um, in the white paper, uh, Framework for a Fairer Future, the Equality Bill, it was said that unless we step up progress, it will take 80 years to elect a representative House of Commons, 100 years uh, for people from ethnic minorities to get the same job prospects um, as white people. And so it was thought that this act could be um, a, a speeder up, as it were, of um, equality. Um, and when the bill, the Equality Bill, came for its second reading in the House of Commons, which my public law class will know is when the main principles of the bill are debated, um, Harriet Harman said uh, on introducing the bill, everyone has the right to be treated fairly and everyone should enjoy the opportunity to fulfil their potential. No one should suffer the indignity of discrimination to be told you're old, so you're past it, to be overlooked because of a disability, to be excluded because of the colour of their skin, um, or to face harassment because you're gay, or to be paid unfairly because they're a woman. So that was the main thrust of the bill and what it was getting at. And um, it was said that this was looking towards the future uh, rather than looking back, and it would make society fairer and richer because um, it would promote opportunities for everyone in society. Um, so the Equality Act 2010 is broad in scope. It covers discrimination at work, um, at schools, at universities, those providing public services, those selling goods. I don't know if anyone rem remembers the gay cake case, but that was about a refusal to write the words support gay marriage uh, on a cake in Belfast. Um, and eventually the European Court of Human Rights sent that away for various reasons. Um, but it's very broad in scope, the Equality Act. Um, and we're going to be focusing on the work context before my wonderful colleague Sarah talks us through housing law, which is not really my area. Um, so um, the first point to note that we're going to talk about today, when we get the PowerPoint working, <laughs> Um, we're going to talk about protected characteristics. Um, great, thanks so much. And these were introduced by the Equality Act. Well, the concept protected characteristics was first used in the Equality Act 2010. And as I was saying, it sought to kind of group together all of these different potential grounds for discrimination. So we had age, disability, gender reassignment, marriage, civil partnership, pregnancy, maternity, race, religion or belief, sex, social orientation. You'll notice that class isn't in there because it was deemed too difficult to determine whether social class could be a ground of discrimination, but that's up for debate and people are talking about that. Um, and the ones that we'll be focusing on today are really uh, sex, uh, gender reassignment, and, and we'll touch on pregnancy and maternity. Section 11 of the Act talks about uh, sex, and it says, in relation to the protected characteristic of sex, a reference to a person who has a particular protected characteristic is a reference to a man or a woman. <laughs> and that is defined in Section 212 as man being a male of any age and woman being a female of any age. So it's not really um, deciding too much there. Um, and when we come to gender reassignment, this is a slightly more nuanced um, protected characteristic. And this is where um, a person, if they are proposing to undergo, if they are undergoing, or they have undergone a process or part of a process for, for the purpose of reassigning the person's sex by changing their physiological or other attributes of sex, then they have the protected characteristic of gender reassignment. Now, the Equality and Human Rights Commission has stressed 
that there is no need to undergo any medical treatment to be protected by gender reassignment. And this is really um, about um, the personal process, as they, as they refer to it, um, of moving away from one's birth sex to the preferred gender rather than through some kind of medical process. <laughs> So it would apply, for example, to uh, someone who dressed uh, as, a, as a man if their natal sex was female uh, and vice versa, provided that that is a, an expression of their gender identity rather than for some other reason, like, you know, if they thought that were funny. Um, so that's what gender reassignment is about. Um, and so just to note that the Gender Recognition Act states that where a person holds a gender recognition certificate, they must be treated according to their acquired uh, gender. Um, so we'll move on now to the main claims. Um, we're barristers, this is what we deal with. Um, and we'll be talking about two main claims here, direct discrimination and indirect discrimination. And these were found in different forms. Um, in the Sex Discrimination Act 1976 um, and the Disability Discrimination Act and the Race uh, Acts as well. Um, and this obviously brought it all together and um, founded one claim of direct discrimination, but on the grounds of all of the many of the protected characteristics. So we can see under subsection one, a person A discriminates against another B if because of a protected characteristic, A treats B less favorably than A treats or would treat others. So breaking that down, you need less favorable treatment. You need to say that the person, let's say the company, let's say an employer, um, so they treat a person less favorably because of a protected characteristic. So because they're disabled, because they're a woman, because they're proposing to undergo gender reassignment. Um, and so there's multiple aspects that we look at when we're litigating these claims in the tribunals and the courts, um, but these are the kind of core elements. And just to flag a few points, because I don't want to go over time too much. Um, so less favorable treatment is broadly defined. It can be the deprivation of a choice. It could be demotion. It can be withdrawing someone's duties, saying you're no longer responsible for recruitment. Um, it can be anything like that. And in terms of what because of a protected characteristic means, this is basically um, the, the protected characteristic needs only be a reason for the treatment. It doesn't need to be the only reason. It doesn't need to be the main reason. If a reason for, unfav for less favorable treatment is race, sex, gender reassignment, then uh, it will be um, because of the protected characteristic. And my colleagues will be talking you through what that means in practice, because the tribunal or the court has to look into the motives or, or the, the reason why the, the less favorable treatment was doled out. So why did this happen, subjectively or objectively? what was the reason for the treatment? Um, and one difficult thing about direct discrimination in practice is that it requires a comparator. So you need to look at um, what a person in a similar position to the discriminated person, how they were treated. So how did the employer treat uh, the uh, person, the, the woman? How did the employer treat the man? Um, but it gets quite technical and it, in practice, it can be difficult um, ensuring that there is a, an appropriate comparator because there must be no material difference between the circumstances of the two people um, apart from the protected characteristics. So they would have to be quite similar. And the employment code from the Equality and Human Rights Commission gives the example of two IT technicians um, they're similar age, no disability, both male, both white. Um, they both go for an internal promotion. One is English, one is Scottish. The Scottish one is better at his job and the English one is less good at his job. If the English person gets the job, 
um, then the Scottish person who's better at the job would um, have a claim of direct discrimination. Um, and they would be appropriate comparators because they're quite similar. But in practice, that can get tricky. You don't really need to worry about it. Um, but essentially, that's one of the difficulties we face. Anyhow, so um, we use what's called a hypothetical comparator in court. Um, and that is where you can say, if there were an appropriate comparator, this is how they would have been treated. And you can use the evidence of the employer's past bad treatment of particular people to evidence that um, and how the hypothetical comparator is construed. Anyhow, you'll see that it gets a bit technical. It's all about freedom and equality, but you know, this is the nitty gritty um, of the law. So just looking at indirect discrimination, this is a different claim and it relates to a um, provision, criterion or practice um, that is applied across the board to a group of people and it puts those with a protected characteristic at a particular disadvantage um, when you compare it to people who don't have the characteristic. Um, and the employer, let's say, can't show that the practice is a proportionate means of achieving a legitimate aim. So, for example, if an employer said um, face time is key in the work culture, um, and that might have an effect on uh, women who may be found to be the main caregivers of children and they would do less well in this work culture because of the face time practice or the face time provision um, that may give those women a claim of indirect discrimination. Um, so that's a sort of broad overview um, of direct and indirect uh, discrimination. Um, the employer, if they are faced with something like that, an indirect discrimination claim that's made out up to that point, they are able to say, well, we can objectively justify that practice um, because of X, Y, Z reason, but they would have to have a legitimate aim of the practice. Um, and they would have to say that this is the least um, discriminatory approach they could take to meet that aim. So what is a good business aim? That comes up a lot. Um, legitimate business interests do include, you know, ensuring that lots of work is done. Um, but if it's just the cheapest way of achieving um, an aim, um, if, it, if it's just about saving money, that probably won't be good enough to say that the discrimination is a proportionate means of achieving a legitimate aim. So you have to have a good aim and you have to say, this indirect discrimination was the least discriminatory way we could do it. Um, so I think that's my bit over. I hope that all makes sense because it is quite technical. Um, and then Nick will be talking us through the um, slideshow after my colleagues are correcting me. Uh, Eleanor Sibley talks us through some of the human rights um, claims or, or in this field. Hi everyone, can you hear me? Yes, yes, sure. great. Um, I'm really sorry not to be there in person, although delighted to hear that there is a massive picture of my head on the wall. Um, <laughs> not, really about that. Yeah. <laughs> not yet, apparently. Okay, oh, there we are. Um, here we go. Now there's a massive picture of my head on the wall. Um, <laughs> I I'm going to be talking a little bit about how the European Convention on Human Rights can apply in this field. And it might be particularly relevant to um, Sarah's case study about housing later. So in claims concerning acts or omissions of public bodies, um, claimants can rely on rights under the European Convention of Human Rights because it's unlawful for public authorities to act incompatibly with them. And just like under the Equality Act, the European Convention on Human Rights uh, includes protection against discrimination. And that is in Article 14, which is on the slide here. And that says, the enjoyment of the rights and freedoms set forth in the convention shall be secured without discrimination on any ground, such as sex, race, color, language, religion, political or other opinion, national or social origin, association with a national minority, property, birth, or other status. There are a few points to note about Article 14. The first 
is that it has no independent existence. It applies to the enjoyment of other rights under the convention. So in order to rely on protection um, against discrimination under Article 14, you've got to show that your case falls within the ambit of one of the other substantive rights of the convention. So for example, if your case concerns um, a right to housing or to live with your family members, then it might fall within the scope of Article 8, um, which is the right to um, respect for private and family life. Or if your claim um, concerns, for example, social security benefits, then it might fall within the scope of Article 1, Protocol 1 of the Convention, which is the right to property. So, for example, in a recent case brought by the Motherhood Plan, who are more um, commonly known as Pregnant Then Screwed, the government's self-employment income support scheme was found to fall within the scope of Article 1, Protocol 1 of the Convention. And so then the claimants could rely on Article 14. Um, however, even though you've got to show that another convention right is engaged in order to rely on Article 14, you don't have to show that it's been breached. And any additional rights that the state provides um, above the bare minimum required by a substantive right must also be provided in a non-discriminatory way. So, for example, Article 8, the right to private and family life, doesn't confer a general right to be housed. But if, just like in the UK, the state provides social housing, then its scheme has got to be non-discriminatory. So that's as an example of a situation in which um, Article 8 would be engaged, but not necessarily breached um, by a failure to provide housing. But you could rely on Article 14 in that situation. Um, so the second point to note about Article 14 is that in some senses it's broader than the protection under the Equality Act because it prohibits discrimination on any ground or and it also refers to any other status. So it's not restricted to the uh, protected characteristics in the Equality Act or the examples of grounds that are given in Article 14. And it's been interpreted pretty broadly. So for example, it includes um, gender identity. Um, there's a case called Eden Toba and others against Georgia in which uh, the court said it covered that and also it would it extend to marital status for example. Just like under the Equality Act uh, the protection against discrimination under article 14 of the European Convention covers direct discrimination and indirect discrimination and it can also um, require the state to treat groups differently in order to correct factual inequalities between them. So, for example, to correct disadvantages that people who are disabled or people who have childcare responsibilities might have. I won't go into the definitions of direct discrimination and indirect discrimination um, under the Convention too much here, because the courts have found, for example, in the case brought by the Motherhood Plan, which I mentioned earlier, that actually the principles are pretty similar under Article 14 and under the domestic law. So for example, in the Motherhood Plan case, um, which was brought on Article 14 grounds, the court looked at domestic case law as well, because it said that the principles were pretty much the same. Um, under Article 14, diff differences um, in treatment will be discriminatory um, and unlawful if there's no objective and reasonable justification. So there are two broad questions that you have to look at here. First, has there been a difference in treatment of persons who are in analogous or relevantly similar situations or a failure to treat differently, per, dif differently persons who are in different situations? If so, then you've got a potentially discriminatory situation. And then you have to look at whether that, that situation or measure or whatever it is pursues a legitimate aim and whether the means employed are reasonably proportionate to the aim pursued. So if there is an objective and reasonable justification that the state can show, then it won't be unlawful discrimination, even if there is a difference in treatment. And the final point that I wanted to raise here was that um, the state, when it comes to whether or not there's an objective and reasonable justification, in some cases, the state has a fairly wide margin of appreciation. In other words, it gets a lot of leeway in terms of deciding whether there is an objective and justifiable, um, an objective and reasonable justification. Um, and that's particularly so in cases concerning issues of social and economic policy. So for example, social welfare benefits or housing. 
Um, and until recently, the general understanding was that in those sorts of cases, the court would only interfere with the, the government's decision on that issue if it was manifestly unreasonable, or at least that was the approach that's been taken in the UK courts. But recently, in a case called SC, Lord Reed looked again at that and he said, well, actually, there's no hard and fast rule that will only interfere with decisions about social rights or economic rights if the government's approach is manifestly unreasonable and actually you need to take a more nuanced approach and look at what sorts of rights are engaged, for example. So, for example, where the case um, concerns rights that the court described as suspect rights, which include sex or disability, then the government may have to uh, provide more weighty reasons, particularly if it's a case of um, direct discrimination. So where it's because of that suspect ground. But it remains the case that where you're alleging discrimination uh, in access to social welfare benefits, for example, um, the court will only interfere rarely and, and, the, and the state will be afforded a wide margin of appreciation. Just before I end, and I promise I'm going to end in a second, um, I just wanted to mention briefly um, another international convention that could be of relevance in the field of um, women's rights, and that is the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, or more commonly known as CEDAW. Um, we've signed up to CEDAW, the UK signed up to CEDAW, but it hasn't been implemented into UK law. So thinking about areas in which the law could go further, this is definitely one of them. Because in the recent case of SC that I mentioned earlier, the court reiterated that if there's an unincorporated international treaty, then the domestic courts have got no jurisdiction to decide whether the uh, state has complied with obligations under that convention or not. However, CEDAW can still be relevant in the UK in two ways. Firstly, um, it's relevant to rights under the European Convention on Human Rights because the Strasbourg courts will look at international conventions. So it can be relevant there. And secondly, um, it can be useful to look at whether the state, or the Secretary of State has implemented a policy um, under which she, they've agreed to comply with CEDAW because if they have, then the court can look at whether that policy has been complied with. Um, and I'm going to end there, but thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you very much, Eleanor. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, we're now going to have our first case study, which is going to be taken to us um, by Nick. Thanks. So you should have a case study that looks a bit like that. Uh, here we go. So Aisha's applying for an internal role as a marketing manager. She's got some feedback, positive feedback that describes her as being very talented. Some other feedback which describes her as being bossy and domineering. She's up against a load of men in the recruitment process. And she isn't appointed, but one of her male colleagues is appointed. And then this is a kind of barrister's dream bit. On the printer, we have this piece of forensic gold. In the team, we have Aisha's gung-ho attitude could be provocative and emasculating for other team members. She also doesn't join Friday night drinks or any of the pub outings, and this could be harmful for team morale. She tends to leave the office at 7 p.m. to go and see her children. The team needs someone visible that they can look up to. So I'm hoping we're going to have a conversation, this is the idea, about, about where we go with this case, what, what claims we might have. So let's start with the sort of headlines, if you like. Let's start at the end, putting the kind of discrimination aspect to one side for now. What's, what's Aisha going to complain about? What are the kind of headline claims, do we think? Front row can keep quiet. Uh, firing, <laughs> firing squad of barristers on the front row. Come on, give me something. Yes, in relation to what I'm, let's put the kind of sex aspect, I'm just looking at the kind of bare bones, the sort of headline things. What's she complaining about? It's a biased uh, decision against her because it was all male team that are feeling feedback against her. 
Yeah, okay. And which decision are you talking about? Yeah. So the fact of the comments themselves, that might be that might be part of her complaint. But what's her real, what's her main complaint going to be? What she it's it's so obvious that you're probably not even thinking about it. What's her main complaint? Well, her main complaint isn't it that she's not been appointed to the role. That's what she's saying is I should have been appointed to that role. I was a strong candidate. So that's that's her first complaint. Is there anything else that she might complain about? A bit more tricky. Come on. I'll give you a clue. It's, yeah, tell me. Yeah, do it. It's also about that kind of private life and stage. It's also about like the average time of people kind of overseas. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. So she might she might have a complaint about the, the sort of fact of those comments, if you like. But I'm I'm looking at the last line. Come on, give it. She resigns. So she's no longer employed. Does that does that leave her with anything claim wise? Yes, tell me. Yes. And what is constructive dismissal? This is a trouble if you answer. If you answer a question, you get asked another one. <laughs> I mean, this is, this is it. This is the real deal. Yeah, it's exactly that. So if your employer does something so terrible <clears throat> that you think and you're entitled to think, I'm not going back. This is dreadful. I'm not going back. Um, you're, you're entitled to treat yourself as having been dismissed, even though you haven't actually been dismissed as such, you can treat yourself as having been dismissed, and it's called constructive dismissal. <coughs> and both of those things, the failure to appoint someone, the failure to um, appoint someone to a new role, failure to promote someone, it is protected under part one of the Act, and likewise, constructive dismissal and indeed ordinary dismissal. It's also protected under the Act, also in Chapter 1. So, we're maybe a third of the way there. Let's think about direct discrimination. And let's talk about the failure to appoint to start with. Is it an act of direct discrimination? And like all lawyers, what we do is we go through the little kind of checklist. So is it less favorable treatment? Do we think it's less favorable treatment? It's gotta be, yeah. And what we're doing here is a comparative exercise. So it's not unfavorable treatment, it's a phrase we see elsewhere. This is less favorable, this is what Anna was talking about. We do this comparative uh, exercise. We can certainly in this case say that she's been treated less favorably than one of her colleagues who who's a man who has been appointed to the role. Can we say that it's because of a protected characteristic? Can we say it's because of her sex? What do we think? It'd be a bit boring if we couldn't, wouldn't it? <laughs> We're certainly going to have a go. We're certainly going to have a go. And what do we think if we go back to the case study? What, what things are we going to rely on? in establishing that causal link between failure to, to appoint and her sex. Talks about a bit of kind of barrister gold. Some old hack like me gonna be banging on about when this case goes to trial. Right. Yeah, which bit? What about emasculating? I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good one for us, isn't it? It's making the men feel less man manly. And what about bossy and domineering in the, in the earlier feedback? Might we, have a, might we have something to go on there? A bossy woman, is a bossy woman the same as an assertive man? Nobody ever describes a man as bossy. No. <laughs> I don't know if you heard that. Nobody ever describes a man as bossy. 
But actually, what we can immediately see is it's not it's not that easy. And do you, why do you think it isn't easy to establish discrimination? He's not a team player. Yes. Doesn't fit in. So that yes, I mean that may be that. I think in a way what you're saying is there might be another explanation. It may just be that actually it's not it's nothing to do with her sex. She's not. She doesn't fit in. Not because she's a woman, just because she's not a very nice person, or she's not, she hasn't got good personal skills. But why else do you think it might be difficult to establish discrimination? In this case, we don't have much information about Max. Because no. Because you have to say there is a discrimination, then we should be able to do like to like comparison. Yeah. And see whatever she lacked. Yes. Man yeah, I mean, if Max was absolutely hopeless and a total moron, we'd probably, <laughs> yeah, we might have even more to go on. That's true. Yeah. I mean, I think it's difficult because it's never clearly stated that it's because she's a woman. Yeah. And how often do you think it is clearly stated? Because <laughs> nobody ever admits it. Nobody ever says, well, we won't appoint that person because she's a woman or because of any other protected characteristic. That's the first reason. And the other, the other reason is that very often people don't realize they're doing it. Very often people discriminate in a an unlawful way without even thinking about it. It's what we call unconscious bias. So very often it's difficult to prove discrimination. And do you know, does anybody know what the law does to try and redress that balance, what the Equality Act does? Thinking about proof, it's a word that we don't always like to use. What it does is it has a revert, what we call a reverse burden of proof. So if an individual can establish a kind of start on the evidence to say, here's a decision that's gone against me, and I think it's because of my protected characteristic, then the law puts the burden on the, in this case, the employer, to establish that that wasn't the case. And that's to reflect the fact that it's difficult to prove discrimination. What about indirect discrimination? Now, Conceptually, it's more difficult, and it doesn't, it's like probably many bits of this act, doesn't look terribly easy when you see it on the page. We talk about PCPs, provisions, criterion, or practice. So, for example, the police, which should probably show my age, the police used to have a policy that you had to be a certain height in order to qualify or in order to apply, I suppose, as a police officer. I don't think they have it anymore. Um, so that was a policy that they had. It's a blanket policy that applies across the force or applied across the force. But of course, certain, certain people with protected characteristics would be discriminated against, would be in a more difficult position to satisfy that. Um, some restaurants, some swanky restaurants that barristers go to, they insist that all their waiting staff speak French. Again, it's a blanket policy. But if you're a French person, you're, you, you've got a significant leg up in that situation. There's quite a bit of talk at the moment about wigs, and the use of barristers' wigs. Again, this is kind of, it's not really strictly an employment situation, but across the board, we're expected in certain circumstances to wear wigs in court. And there are certain groups of, um, in this case, ethnic groups, who will say, well, actually for us, or religious groups will say, it's not, it's not good, it's not good for us. So that's, that's indirect discrimination. You have a blanket policy that applies across the board. It, it's not intended to be discriminatory. It's, you know, it's done always for some other purpose, but the effect of it is that a particular group is, if you like, singled out. So how do we think that might apply to poor old Aisha? This is a bit more tricky. Where is she? Here she is. Tell me. Yes, Friday night drinks. Yeah. I mean, Friday night drinks is quite a common one because it will have an impact on those with caring responsibilities, and usually that means women. It will also have an impact on particular religious groups. It will also have an impact on people who don't drink 
because of a, for a religious reason. So Friday night drinks is a, is a bit of a kind of important law classic. Um, was there anything else? I think that probably was it. What's the, what's the employer going to say? I suppose the other one might be late, staying late at the office, quite similar in a way. But again, very common that an office has a regime where you're expected to stay late. It's never, it's rarely kind of written, but there's an expectation that you will stay late. And those that leave at five o'clock on the dot are, are judged, are judged for leaving. It's very, it's something that happens very commonly. What's the employer going to say? You sort of said it already. They're going to say it's great for morale. Everyone likes to go out and get drunk. And we we perform so much better um, when we have this kind of team building. If you've ever been on a team building exercise, you probably feel otherwise. <laughs> going back finally to the justification. Oh. proportionate means of achieving legitimate aim. Is the, is the employer going to justify it in these, in these circumstances? They're going to say Friday night drinks is so, is so good. It's the only way. It's the only way of sorting out this team morale. Probably not. Probably not. They'll try it. They will try it. They will certainly try it. Um, but of course, you know, in some situations, that's very much the obvious answer. That is the way out. So the Catholic Church, I imagine, insists that its priests are all Catholics. Now, obviously, that's a practice that's totally discriminatory. But I guess they would say it's a proportionate means of achieving their legitimate, their legitimate aim. <laughs> <laughs> no, it wasn't going to be. It wasn't going to be a Catholic. And I suppose they're all men as well, aren't they? I think they have to be men, yeah. They're all men. You would have to ask the Bible about that, which is <laughs> or a Catholic. Right. Before I get into hot water. I'm sit down. <laughs> Thank you. And we've now got uh, Sarah, who's going to take us through. Oh, go, yeah, yeah, it's coming. Just have a little question about yeah. um, the Friday night drinks. Does it fall into the practice part of danger? Yes, I mean, so that PCP thing is quite, is, is, is sort of self-contained if you sort of mean. So I don't think you're generally required to say, is it, oh, is it X, so Y, or Z? It's like just, yeah, I mean, you can imagine like all these things, there's loads of law on it. Um, it doesn't have to be a written policy. It can be a practice. It can be a sort of informal practice. Um, yeah, it's complicated, but it's, but it's, but it's, it's broad, yeah, sorry. Now we're going to hear from Sarah on the public law case study. Yes, uh, I was asked to come up with something on, this, on housing, and it's actually quite difficult because um, I can see one person who may disagree with me on this in the audience, but it doesn't really come up, not on the face of it. We deal a lot with the Equality Act, usually disability. The fact that someone is a woman isn't coming up. You don't get people seeking to evict someone because they're a woman. Um, so it's actually quite difficult to do. And that's odd because it's very much lurking in the background. Because when you look at people in social housing, very often one of the reasons they are there is because they have children. When you look at um, people who've had to do, uh, rely on social housing because they uh, can't afford to rent it anywhere because they're not working at the moment. Very often the reason is because they're women, they were working, they um, had children, they've had to take time off work, they've had to depend on benefits, uh, and that's how they've ended up. So it is always there, but it's never really expressed. And the first part of the case study, which is quite broad, we might not get into all of it, but I thought it really was just a discussion because we've got Aisha applying to the local authorities homeless. She puts on her application that she's got one child and she's pregnant with another. Okay. Um, oh. Right. 
this first part. Right, uh, Isha applies to the local authorities home. She puts on her application. She has one child and she's pregnant with another. Um, do you think that gives her any benefit? In the whole, you know, think about how many local, local authorities there are. Think about how many homeless people they uh, have applying for them each day. Do you think she has some kind of way of rising up the ladder? Do you think she should have? No. What about if she had um, a terminal illness? Do you think she should be given preferential treatment over a fit, healthy, able-bodied 25-year-old? So why is it different if she has a child? Do you think the, the need to protect the child, if there is one, should confer on her a benefit? Because otherwise, what's the option? The state has a duty to the child. She can't be housed by her mother, have to be housed by the state, or have to go into foster care. That's not good for anyone. So, one of the re uh, homelessness, when you apply, one of the ways, you, there are a number of tests you have to satisfy. One of them is a vulnerability. Um, and you can have vulnerability for many reasons. It can be old age. It can be an illness you have, physical or mental. But it can also be having a child. And that is not uh, restricted to women. It can, of course, be a man who has a child. But in most cases, let's be honest, it's the woman who has the child. Um, what I thought was an interesting discussion was bearing in mind there is this scheme of priority uh, because there has to be because we cannot just we cannot house everybody who needs accommodation so you have to look at who needs it most it's the vulnerable who need it most the people do who do have uh, a very serious mental illness or physical illness or have children or old age there is no special category for women by themselves now the test used uh, it, it's, it's a test of uh, one of the other things you've got to satisfy is um your ability to deal with being homeless. Are you less able to deal with being homeless? It's a minefield. Who is able to deal with being homeless? And we've got a hypothetical comparison. Who's the hypothetical person who could apparently cope well with this? You have to be able to deal um, not as well as this hypothetical person. And the test used to be a street homelessness. And it's not anymore, but that is obviously a reality. But you can be homeless if you're sofa surfing, if you're in a hostel. And I thought it was genuinely an interesting question of, is there any scope for having a priority on the basis that you are a woman? Recognizing that in some situations on street homelessness, in hostels, if you're sofa surfing, are you more at risk of violence? Are you more vulnerable solely because you're a woman? That's not to say every woman is, but what do people think? Maybe a show of hands. Who thinks there should be potentially some recognition for this built in? Who thinks there shouldn't? Who's abstaining? <laughs> Most people. <laughs> um, well, that's where well, well, there isn't any special treatment. You can get it through other ways by having the children, but absolutely nothing. Women, men, treated the same. Um, moving to the second part, which is a far more tricky problem. But Aisha has um, moved in with her parents. They are the tenants of the local authority. Um, her father dies, her mother dies. And so uh, it's looking at whether this tenancy can pass on. It's what we call succession. And there are a lot of complicated rules about when and how a tenancy can pass on. The local authority takes the view, no, it can't pass to you because there's already been one succession. The tenancy passes from the mother to the or father to the mother. That's one succession. The law says you can only have um, that one. So you're out of luck. Um, on the law as it stands, leave aside any discretionary policies, that's it. And I've taken this from a case where th these matters were raised because, again, it's not expressed. It's not because she is a woman, but they tried to hinge the fact that she was a woman on some of the other rights. We we're looking at what she might try to defend the claim. Um,
As Eleanor said, Article 14 leads another right engaged. If there's a claim for possession, Article 8 is engaged. So you've got access to Article 14, um, which says that there can't be any discrimination. Discrimination on any ground such as sex. Um, if the tenant, the tenancy had passed from her father to her mother on divorce rather than on death, her position would have been different. She wouldn't have been a second successor. And it was argued that, I'm trying to find my notes, um, there are more divorced women than men in England and more widows than widowers. So successor spouses are more, than li are more likely to be women than men. So this case would be the mother. Um, the rule of having only one succession therefore has a greater impact on women than men and amounted to discrimination. Uh, this was not successful at the county court. It went quite a long way. Any thoughts on that? It's not quite indirect discrimination, but it's following that line of it. She's not discriminated against immediately because she's a woman, but it's being said, ultimately, she is in a worse position, however she gets there, because she is a woman. Women are, because they're more likely to be divorced and they're more likely to live to their old age and be a widow. And so basically all of this is impacting women more. Why are there more divorced women than men? <laughs> there should be an equal number. Yeah, haven't they been divorced? They have married. Or the men die, so they're no longer yeah. divorced, they're just dead. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that I don't know, that did strike me as odd. I was willing yeah. to buy the, there are more widows than widowers because yeah. women tend to live yeah. longer. But, uh, but the problem is the detriment. Who suffers the detriment? It's not the widow, it's their children. It was, but it was being run as a policy that the, the, the policy of only one succession was discriminately inher uh, discriminated inherently because more women. So it was unlawful policy. It just doesn't seem to work. <laughs> <laughs> See, it's not hitting the right person yeah. because I usually could equally be a boy yeah it could but all right then let's say it's a mother let's for any reason it's the mother but some reason she's not entitled because there's been a second succession um so you can't show that she is worse off because she's a woman what you can do is say as a woman she is in this class of people who are more likely to be affected in a discriminatory manner it's the kind of statistical approach yeah would anyone like to get all right let's hands up who thinks ultimately this was a successful argument? You are all right. <laughs> it uh, was a brave and valiant step, not by me. I'm not. I'm not, I'm not I tried very hard. It didn't work. Um, no, it. Um, but I thought it was an interesting way of looking at it. Again, this it, it doesn't come in very often, but there are ways. And on what was being put forward. It does, there's at least the potential that women are being affected and they are being affected more and they are being affected to their detriment. But it's to what extent the law has to step in. At what, uh, at what point does the law have to step in? And at what point uh, should a whole policy be, be struck down? Or at what point should a policy be tweaked to allow, prefer it's not preferential treatment, but it, to allow equity, parity between the two. Um, Very nearly there. Um, we're back to Aisha having children. If the local authority has a policy, so they can have a policy, they can say, it doesn't matter what the law says, we're going to you know, allow people to possibly have a succession, another succession, but it's going to depend on your circumstances. You know, we're going to look, if you're, if you're the Duke of Buckingham, then you're not going to get one, but you know, we've got this, we can look at your circumstances. Should her children be, a factor in relation to that again should she be getting um points in her favor to get her a tenancy if she has children it is relevant particularly if if she applied as homeless if she can say well if i applied to you as homeless you'd have to put me in a three-bedroom property because these are the children i have and overcrowding 
and this is a three bedroom property. So I'm not getting anything I wouldn't be getting otherwise. You're going to have to give me this. Why not just give me this one? There are a lot of other factors that come into play in relation to that, and it is discretionary. So um, that, that's not a be all or end all. But again, it's something interestingly where possibly women are in a better position, bearing in mind they are likely to be the primary carer. Um, it's a whole minefield if, if custody is split. Um, but uh, I think that's probably it. We haven't got to discuss everything, but um, I threw quite a lot in there. And as I say, interestingly, it was very difficult to tie this to any direct sort of discrimination against women. Um, perhaps we take away from it uh, that it is out there. It's just not always expressed. It's not always clear. It's not always the only reason or the be all and end all, but it is perhaps something to keep in mind um, and perhaps something that will be addressed in the future. Thanks. Thanks. Well, I think that just about wraps it up. Yep. Um, thank you for your yes. time. Yes. Many thanks to Sarah, Nick, and Anna and Eleanor <laughs> looming above us. <laughs> um, and thank you so much for coming both in person and online. Uh, we are going to be around for a little bit afterwards to chat and answer questions. And I think there's some wine and some food outside. Um, not that this is Friday after, after work, Chris. <laughs> no one is under any pressure uh, both to come or not to come. Um, but thank you very much for coming along today and uh, listening and participating. And um, yes, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank well you. done.